Welcome to another edition of the Hit the Lights podcast. I've got a very special guest with me today, somebody I've known for a long time, Mr. David Patterson. How are you? Not too bad, guy. Yourself? Yeah, I'm okay, thank you. So obviously, filling the viewers in, we've obviously known each other quite a long time, haven't we? Uh, since 2007, I think. Yeah, roughly around then, wasn't it? So yeah. To fill, <laughs> the, to fill the listeners in, um, myself and David are actually apprentices together at the same company, and we worked together for what was it about ten years ten or so? Years. Yeah, it's t- bang on ten years. Yeah. So probably to fill everyone in, tell me how you came to into the electrical industry. Well. Basically, when I was younger, I wanted to work with my hands, um, but I didn't know what trade to go into. Um, didn't really fancy car mechanics at all. Didn't really um, didn't really settle with me very well. So basically, I went with my dad to Bretton Woken College. They were having an opening night, and uh, basically, the first door I walked straight into was the electrical installation. So I basically sat there for an hour, uh, met the teacher, and he just thought to myself, you know what, this has really intrigued me. So uh, following a couple of weeks, I then went to Bretton Working College for two years and needed an apprenticeship, and that's how I ended up at ALP. So you did a two-year... Full-time. Uh, full-time, and then you eventually got the part-time apprenticeship. So that's when, correct, when... yeah. So when you did the, or you went into the part-time apprenticeship, did you start back at square one again, year one, or did you go straight into year two or three? I went straight into year two because of the MVQ level three. Um, They thought it might be too much work to get that completed uh, within the year. So what they said is basically go back into year two, but obviously I didn't have to do the exams. So I spent only half a day at college once a week um just obviously doing like the mvq things like that and um once that was completed that was that was it really went straight into uh, level three and that's obviously when i had to take the exams because those were new exams and obviously you're learning for your am2 installation and doing all the practices the practical yeah stuff like that really mate so you say obviously when you kind of went into the college and sat down and electrical was the first thing that that engaged with you, what was it that spoke to you about the electrical industry that made you want to go into it for a career? It's the science behind it. It's not what people think it is. It's, you can't just grab any cable and just wire it into anything. It's got to be cable calculated for the right amperage. Uh, you know, for the distance, the volt drop, everything else. It's not just picking up a bit of copper tubing and just welding it. With other trades, to me, it was just looking at it, just doing the same thing every single day. But then when you go into the electrical industry, it's it's, it's massive. There's, there's so many different routes you can go down to, so many doors to walk through. It's completely endless. Um, so that's what really intrigues me. So obviously, once you came into the part-time apprenticeship, that was when our paths crossed. <laughs> I still remember that as well. <laughs> I was I was outside having a fag, and then you walked up and you looked at me, and I looked at you. And you went, you walked straight over your hand and went, "Hi, I'm Gary Alder." <laughs> <laughs> I'm nothing if not polite. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, mate. <laughs> um, so you then joined ALP Electrical, which was the yep. company we both work for. Yep. Um, what sort of work were you doing throughout that time in your apprenticeship? Oh, wow. My first job, <laughs> my first job was to put a wind turbine up by McDonald's, um, by Majeski Stadium. And I still believe that's still there today. So I, I have a little giggle every time I drive by. I, I um, think I saw that fall. I, was, <laughs> I think it fell down. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. Um, <laughs> and after that, uh, I went into the Thames Water to treatment site. It was my first site was Morton and Marsh with James Holt. So once I 
started really understanding what was going on in Thames water sites and the process, it just opened my eyes because you wouldn't really know what happens when you flush your toilet to the water that comes out your tap. It was pretty incredible, really. And then because it was industrial, you got more hands-on work. Um, obviously, with your cable tray, your ladder racking, your arm and cables, your signal cables, everything. So it was just a completely different ball game, completely different to domestic. Did you get to experience any domestic during the, that early period of your career? A week, a week's worth and a house in Slough, and I did not enjoy it at all. What about that didn't you enjoy that you did enjoy with the industrial side? Um, well, it's a bit different because when you, you have to deal with the owners of the house, obviously, um so when you tell them that you're ripping up the floorboards they start questioning it uh why are you doing that is it going to go back down is it is, is the floor going to squeak it's going to have gaps in it and you can only do the best you can do with that you know these floorboards are probably as old as the house um and then you've got to you know drill your holes through all the joists you've got to run all the cables in and it's just it can be so tricky if, if you can lift up the floor in or take a ceiling down to run all your cables in to, to do that, it's, it's so simple. It, your life is so simple, but it's never that simple. And when the other thing that irritates irritated me about uh, working domestically is once you get to know them, the customer, they then start asking you for favours. Oh, could you just move that socket over a little? Could you just move that light switch to the other side, please, for us, if you've got time? And then they get funny when you ask for extra money, and then you, and then and then they get funny when you tell them the work you've got to do. Like, I've got, okay, I can do that, but I've got to chase your walls out. Oh, why is that? Well, how's how's the cable going to get there? So, and you didn't really have that issue with the industrial side. If you're doing a new install, you've got all your ducting done. You've got the challenge of doing your containment, and the best thing I loved about that is it's going to be there for about 20, 30 years or even longer than that. So your work is actually on display for people to come and have a look at. And that's what really done it for me, basically. So what do you think are some of the key skills that are required when doing industrial work over domestic then? The main thing is you've got to have an open mind. You've, you've, you've got to be willing to learn different things. That's, that's, that's what I think is the main, is the main thing that you need. But it's, it's endless. It's, you know, with your profit bus, you've got to do a profit bus course. You never even, you, you ask a domestic electrician, he wouldn't even know what that is. There's other, there's, there's the control side as well. Uh, you know, your flow meters, your ultrasonics, all of that. You need to, you need to learn about all of that. Then you need to start trying to learn how an ICA section works in an MCC, all the controls. So yeah, it's, yeah, completely different ball game. Everything. Yeah. Completely different. Just, just for anyone listening who doesn't know what ICA is, that's instrumentation control and autom- automation panel. Um, so we were quite lucky in that we worked for a bespoke control manu- panel manufacturer as well. What were some of the elements that you ended up learning as a result of the diversity of installations that ALP was fortunate to give you? Oh, the main thing I picked up was actually the power and control separation the segregation that you needed between them because obviously if you if you do it the magnetic field off the the power cable uh, interferes with the signals and the control cable can give you false readings weak signals unfortunately i didn't actually get too involved with the panel sides what i was uh, what i did regret a lot but every time my opportunities came up, I was then moved on to a different project. I always wanted to build a control panel from scratch because that's the only way that you can really, really learn about it. So in terms of like having containment and other things on show, are there any particular tips or tools that you have come across during your years of, of completing that type of work that you can offer to maybe a, maybe an apprentice that was in your position? Um, learn Best advice I'll give an apprentice now is learn the hard way before you get to learn the easy way. Learn how to actually mark up and cut straight by hand 
and not always rely on, for example, a chop saw. Uh, chop saw. So if you're going to cut some trunk in or some uni strut brackets, learn how to cut it up by hand first. Learn how to cut straight. Learn how to file properly. Do all of that because you're never, ever going to have all the opportunities to have a chop saw. I came across a third year apprentice who I asked to cut some strut up and not one side was completely straight. And when I asked him, so can you not cut straight? He goes, this is the first time I've ever done it. So he's had two years of having it the easy way. So when it came to it, to do it by hand, it took three times as long. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd, I'd also add into that manufacturing your own bends. Um, which... You're not allowed not not allowed on terms of water sites to make, to make your own bends. You have to buy them. But it doesn't mean that you can't learn how to do them. I'd agree with Thames, Thames Water and stuff, but industry, industrially as a sector, yeah, there's there's plenty of opportunity out there to go and find 100%. your own bends. Yeah. yeah, it's the the best one. What I learned on to work my angles out with was actually to use cable tray, because that from that you can learn how to how much of the lip to cut out, how much to bend it. And that you can use as a template with trunking. So I always found it easy to use a bit of cable tray because it was the simplest one to do and then move on to the more complex things. Yeah. So obviously from there, obviously you completed your apprenticeship with ALP Electrical. I assume obviously you, well, I say I assume, I know that you went into becoming um, a lead electrician on lots of projects. Yeah, that's what so, I uh, that's what I was very keen on. So, what sort of work did they get you doing straight out? Um, oh, I think if I remember rightly, the third the first time I went solo was at Broadmoor Hospital for three months. Um, I was given my own van, so I'd done my time. So. I, qualified yet and then i well yeah the very first time on my own was at broadman hospital so basically i was there to help out their maintenance team around the hospital again was a bit of an eye opener because that is commercial but in its own league for obvious reason um, so what do you think it's just a security so obviously they have particular ways of doing install for for safety. Yes. What what sort of things uh, would you encounter or have to do? Because um, obviously typical light fittings aren't going to be used. Typical socket, sockets and other bits aren't going to be used. So what sort of products and accessories were you having to install and, and complete? So for a perfect example, I have to change light fitting in a in in a room <laughs> it's not a cell it's a room and it funny enough it was a yorkshire rippers room so <laughs> he had to be removed and i had to put the ladder up have a look at the light and for obvious reasons every single fixing is a security screw and they keep changing the the style of the head to make it more difficult for um, patients to undo them. So with that one, the lights, the light fittings are completely out of reach. There's, there's absolutely no chance of reaching them at all. You have to go up a ladder. Um, the other ones were sockets. I changed a lot of sockets. So they had to be obviously security screwed. Um, but what we also had to do is actually use a ceiling compound round the socket so um, if the screws broke um, they would struggle to even get the face off because you have to take in consideration a lot of these patients are suicidal so one of the best ways of doing that obviously is to be electrocuted go over the top with your installations and the, this took five times as long yeah and no, I remember managing that contract obviously they one of the other key elements with working in there I remember was the signing in and out of tools yes that was basically what we had to do i left my tool bag there uh in the maintenance area so what i'd have to do every single day i had to get like a basically like a scorecard and i would write the name down every single tool 
and I would then tick it myself. So it's so I basically had my initials, and I had to tick every single tool. And I was taking around a full set of tools, so full set of screwdrivers, hacksaws, uh, tape measure, everything basically. And I would get stopped about five, six times a day at least, minimum. Um, and what would happen? Security guard would come up to you and go, "Can I, have, can I see your scorecard?" I was like, "Yep, yeah, okay." And you would have to have your scorecard on you at all times as well. And they would literally look through every single bit of kit you've got. Yeah, I remember one particular incident um, at another hospital that we were servicing where one of the patients actually grabbed a screwdriver off the engineer and obviously tried to assault. And, yeah, it certainly becomes a high-pressure situation when you've got mentally unwell people, you know, uh, with, with sharp objects. Yep, absolutely. The the best advice I was given is if you see someone coming towards you, you put your tools in your bag straight away. Um, I had a tango of me anyway, who is someone who was escorting me at all times. Because um, obviously I had clearance, but I didn't actually work for them, if that makes sense. So what you have to do is quickly pack up your tools, put your tool bag behind your legs and put your back to the wall. So basically you let them walk past but you are shielding your tools, and if they if they were to grab them, at least you can. Pin, well, technically, your tango has to do this. Um, you could pin them. You, could, you can't hurt them. You have to pin them. So, but, but with your tool bags behind your legs, you're stopping them from uh, grabbing uh, a tool, basically, that can be used as a weapon. Because a terminal screwdriver for, is a perfect example of how damaging that could be yeah i think one of the things obviously broadmoor being one of the clients i think we were very fortunate at alp um it's only now we've obviously spent some time away realizing what a broad variety of work we actually had there incredible incredible what what were some of the other projects that you were involved with uh environmental agency i've done a lot of locks um a lot of testing a lot of test inspection, um, a lot of remedials, all up and yeah. down the Thames. That was fantastic. It was lovely in the summer, absolutely lovely. You can you've got the good weather, you've got the boats out, the, the sun hits the water, it's beautiful. Um, but for obvious reasons, we couldn't do the remedial works in the summer because it's the busy season. So unfortunately, we had to do that in the winter, uh, where you probably get one or two boats that will go through the lock. Obviously, a lot of these sites were shut down as well. So the weir gates would have to be done manually and not uh, not motorised. Yeah, I think one of the uh, main things I remember is we had a lot of design challenges with marine installations and obviously boat charging for the public. And uh, obviously they have their sewage systems, don't they, that they pump out into so that they can... Um, empty their, their sewage storage tanks on the boats into the That's UAs. Right. And I can remember having a lot of issues on those with discrimination of RCDs and feeding off very old installations that were already RCDs, didn't have the right time delays, etc. Uh, you know, yeah. TT arrangements and having to shut down quite a lot of locks and weirs to put those right um, was... Not difficult work, but it certainly was long days, weren't they? Yeah, absolutely. But you didn't mind it because if the weather was nice, you're happy. Well, that's me anyway. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's probably everyone if the sun's shining. One of the other large projects, obviously, we worked on um, was Aldermaston in Reading. Wow, yeah. That was... uh... That was some project, wasn't it? That was doing a uh, fire alarm and PA install. It was, yeah. I think I've spoken about it before, and I don't think we learned a particular amount, and we actually struggled with our MVQs on that, because that was during our apprenticeships, wasn't it? Yep. We had to get a letter signed and confirmation through uh, to the college saying that we could not take photos, because of for security reasons, it's a MOD site, so... Yeah, no phones allowed at all. And if you did get caught with a mobile phone, you were moved off site. Your phone was taken. It was then scanned. Um, and they would look through all your history, all your phone call histories, all your messages, everything. So they would find absolutely all your details that you've done through your phone. 
So we had to check him in every single day. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I remember that. That wasn't a fun time. I don't. I didn't enjoy that job at all. With the the amount of hours in darkness, and then essentially during the winter winter months, just coming yeah. in darkness, working in darkness, leaving in darkness. <laughs> uh, that but was I um, but I do have a funny memory of AWE. Go on then. I do remember someone having lunch with me in my car, and then was too lazy to take their bag back to their car. And this was on a Friday, so they thought, oh, I'll just leave my backpack by your car and we'll grab it later. And then when we came out to leave work, we weren't allowed out of the building because they found a, uh, <laughs> a ba- an unattended backpack. And I think we both know who the owner was, wasn't it? <laughs> you live and learn. You live and learn. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to tell the listeners or do you want me to do it? Yeah, it was some dodgy apprentice, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> we this with GA, we just leave it at that. <laughs> do you know? Do you know what? I completely forgot about that. That was so funny. <laughs> just two armed police officers, like everyone staying as a possible bomb, uh, bomb threat in the car park. Someone left an unattended bag. <laughs> oh, is it next to a Rover Twenty Five by chance? Yes. Why? <laughs> Do you want to uh, go and have a word with them, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> there were some lethal sandwiches in there as well. It. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So obviously years went, years rolled by, and your hair got thinner. And yeah, the... absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, the stress came with it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's probably a valid point. So do you want to like maybe explain a bit about the stresses of taking on responsibility? Um, yeah, so how I see, if this is me personally, this might not be for everyone, but you want to do a good job. And that come, it does come with a lot of stress. And you're dealing with the client head on. You know, you're the electrical supervisor on site. You're, you're the go-to guy. You know, you haven't got someone in the office to always be there to deal with issues or talk about extra stuff like you've you've got to do it basically and obviously you're running a team and you know you're responsible for the health and safety you're responsible for them to be busy you're responsible for them to be learning so it, it can be challenging it can be because these guys that you work with, they turn into your friends at the end of the day. And with an apprentice, you build a relationship out of them, you get to know them, you get to kind of know their family, you get to know their background, and at the end of the day, you start going to the pub with them, and you become friends. So this can be an issue, obviously, because when you're trying to do a job and you've got a time frame and you've got to stick to it strictly – they start looking looking at you as a mate rather than a supervisor. And this does get stressful. This is what used to stress me out a lot because I'm a very blunt person. I will say what's on my mind. If I'm not happy, you will know about it. And as people do know, if you don't benefit me, you're gone. I, I will kick you off site. It doesn't matter who you are. I will get you off site. I can um, remember you giving me many a headache. Yeah, that's what I do, mate. That's what I do because I care. <laughs> the, the thing is with that is I care about the project. I care about that getting done. I care about the job being done at a high standard. You know, it's no shortcuts. Just do it properly. Do a good job. Get a pat on the back from, you know, your contact, from your tier one company, or even, even higher is the client. You know, get them to be happy because at the end of the day, these guys are going to give you more work because of you. And then people start asking for you specifically, you know, um, and that's, and that's what being a supervisor is. It is being, it's being a friend, but you, you've got to be respected. You've got to teach apprentices. Yes, we are friends out of work, but in work, I'm your supervisor. I'm responsible for you. You have to show me enough respect for you to actually do some hard work. You need you need to show me that so we can do it together, you know. And this is why I had great relationships with a lot of guys that we used to work with, you know. I've got a lot of respect for those guys because they I'm here because of them. At the end of the day, you know, 
and I showed them the respect and I kept going back on their projects. I was happy to stay away from uh, stay away from home to go on uh, different sites like Derby, Rolls Royce, Bentley down in Portsmouth. Um, uh, what was it? Middlesbrough as well. Manchester was an airfield as well. So that was a completely different ball game. And, and it was a good feeling that people were asking for you. They'll ring you up, uh, you know, and ask you. Not They won't let the, the boss ask you. They will come to you first and say, hey, look, I've got this job. I need someone who's hardworking and you fit the bill. Are you up for it? So so kind of in that answer is the stress is obviously advised. It was also some really good advice for apprentices. Mm. When someone has a go at you, don't take it personally at all. Just, just literally wait until the end of the day and your chemistry with the with the, your supervisor will be completely different. You'll be going down the pub with him, having a chat, like nothing happened that day. But then at work, it will go back to how it was. So obviously, just put your head down, work hard, and not only are you making your life easy, but you're making supervisor's life a lot easier as well. Because I, I was a working supervisor. I, wasn't, I didn't like sitting in the office all the time at all. Hated it. Unless I was doing paperwork, I couldn't stand it. I needed to get out, do some work. So when I took over Beckton, what was a massive project for us, I was a working supervisor. So mm. I, had my own t- I had my team, and we completed the job, and it ended up being a very, very good installation. So that was actually a particularly interesting job, obviously. So at the Beckton Sewage Treatment Works, yeah. we completed uh, the powerhouse upgrade which yep. was the replacement of, I think it was An three. MCC. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was the MCC, and then we had, I think it was three MCCs supplied by three Transformers in a ring main, Yeah, if I remember correctly. And no, it was two. It was, t- it was two MCCs. No, no, it was three, yeah, it was three MCCs, uh, two out in the main hall and one in the control room. So that, that, was, consi- that was considerable job for the company at the time wasn't it that was a that was getting towards the top echelon of probably 250k as a project yeah and we had an added difficulty didn't we with asbestos yes that's correct yeah so uh with that had to be face fitted um so i had to be clean shaven and with the face fitting it's it, it that wasn't even what i thought it was so even i got a bit of surprise with that so through through the face fitting, um, you would have to wear a mask and you would have to basically exercise so they can actually look at your breathing and they would calculate how fit you are, basically. So um, if you're moving around in a building a lot and you're wearing this mask a lot, obviously your breathing is a little bit restricted, not overly too much, but it is in a way. So you had your full face masks um, for the really dangerous areas where it would obviously filter the air through. And then you had your half masks where it wasn't as bad. Um, but the main thing was obviously to be clean shaven and to make sure there was a complete seal around your face to the masks. Because obviously we all know how dangerous asbestos is. Yeah, so that was uh, something I hadn't encountered before in terms of asbestos. No. But it was it was actually mixed into the historic concrete of the building wasn't it that's right and over time the dust that was accumulating within within the building was was dangerous to breathe in yeah absolutely Um, it's great experience great experience it it was so at the same time as replacing all the lv switch gear as we did we actually had crews cleaning the building didn't we that's correct yeah and what they would do is they would literally clean everything by hand and then they would seal off a area and they would clean it, and then what they would do is they would get these monitors in, and they would work for about three hours, three to four hours each end, and that would basically tell you what's in the air. So once that area was clean, and once it was tested and it was proved and had a certificate of it, um, then they would open that area up for you not to wear your masks. And Mm -hmm. it it was incredible. It was incredible watching these guys work because obviously it's a high-risk job, so watching them work as as a team again is respecting another trade yeah definitely that was a a technically challenge as well as management challenging job yeah absolutely so obviously you mentioned about staying away something we did quite a lot of together (laughs) yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) um 
obviously that that can put its own stresses on onto the job as well what and obviously with yes, the nature can, yeah. of, with the nature of industrial work obviously it's all over the country you, you don't necessarily get to pick and choose that the the work is in your vicinity and you have to work away is there any advice you'd give for people who regularly have to stay away or potentially are looking at that sort of lifestyle choice go with someone if you have to work away with someone go with someone you get on well with that is that is the main thing you cannot go and work with someone that you either don't respect or don't like or don't get on with at work you just can't do it you you think about the money and it's not worth it at the end of the day because this guy you're re- you're basically going to be with him 24 7 you're gonna you're gonna travel to the job together you're gonna work all day together then you're gonna go back to the hotel together you're then gonna have dinner together then you're gonna see this guy first thing in the morning again and it's the same and if this job goes on for months you're basically in a way torturing yourself and then things you're not happy and i know this is difficult <laughs> this is difficult to say to people but you've got to be happy at work for you to enjoy your job and for you to learn about it you've got to be happy if you're not happy you're not going to learn you're going to be absolutely miserable and all you're going to do is wish your life away and you're going to wish it was just a weekend you'd, you'd be there monday morning oh god i can't wait till it's friday and then that shouldn't be your attitude. You should, your attitude on Monday morning goes, come on, guys, just crack this out. Let's just, just hit this hard and we can have an earlier Friday. Then everyone's morale goes through the roof. But with staying away, get a decent place. Don't torture yourself over a couple of quid. Because with us, we um, had to dig money, didn't we? So the cheaper the place you got, the more money extra you would get in your pocket. It's not mm. worth it it's not worth the extra hundred pound in your pocket because at the end of the day, if you, if you've got a good bed, like if you stay in the premier Inn, for example, or one of those style hotels, you, you know, for a fact, they're all the same wherever you go. You've got a good bed, you've got digital TV, you've got a pub downstairs with good food. Um, you know, try and get a place that's near a town as well. Obviously secure car parking is the main issue is that you need that. But pick somewhere that you can go out and venture out in, in the evenings. You you don't have to treat a stand away job like a like it's a prison job. You know, you're not like you're confined to that hotel. Go out, go and explore a town. If you're, you know, uh, good, good examples. Myself and another colleague stayed away in Manchester to, uh, for six weeks uh, on an airfield project, and we got the hotel right near the Trafford Centre. So for dinner, we had, I think there's about 30 different places to eat. So we used to go out there every night, do a bit of shopping. And there's bars there. It's near Old Trafford as well. So we went out, we went to Old Trafford. Um, there's loads of places. That Yeah, the best advice is, is get, get decent digs. Be happy and go with someone that you like. I think that's probably where I messed up then. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just... oh. Wow, the, the the stuff that happened with me stayed away. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we could tell those stories. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Of well, we used to prank each other a lot, didn't we? When we used to stay away. Yeah, I, I remember generally it, it was mattresses against the doors. If you that's it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The bed out in the corridor. <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, for good times. So obviously you talk about being happy then. So what do you enjoy most about the electrical industry? It's learning. You just, you just learning every day. You get to meet new people. And another good thing is, is that you see that person again on a different job. It's amazing. I've been doing, say for example, Thames Water Sites for 10 years. I still bump in the same guys that I met when I was an apprentice. So they get to see you, how far along you've came, and then you get more responsibility and stuff like that. But yeah, it's just, it's never ending, stop, it's never stops. You never stop learning about it. There'll always be a job that you go on to that will just blow your mind. You know, when we worked together in the Crossrail project and mm. they called the hole through 
on the ground ready for the track and when i saw that for the first time it, it literally blew my mind and then it's then you're all the panel gears that you're getting ready just yeah just loved it absolutely still do absolutely love it yeah you can definitely tell you're still in love with it um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your poor wife um so in terms of the industry moving forward then is there anything you'd like to see introduced into the industry a lot of the stuff that I wanted introduced has been introduced. Perfect so example is mental health. Yeah, so, yeah, mental health, yeah. Yeah, so now we have mental health first aiders. What I think is extremely crucial to have on these projects, you're looking out, you're looking out for people, you know, because myself now, I'm, a, I'm an AP. I, my, my job title is an electrical supervisor for a tier one company um, and I'm basically an electrical AP so I can do shutdowns and write permits and I basically look after electrical subcontractors that's Mm -hmm. my job and what you do with that is you try and you get to know the guys and then you start asking the same questions you know how was your weekend stuff like that and then you can always pick up when someone's not happy because you get to know them. You know, you don't just sit in an office and let people go and do it. You get out there and you get to know these guys. And then you can always see a change in tone. So then you think, ah, oh, wait a minute, he doesn't seem quite happy. Then you go up to him or her and say, look, he's everything right, you know. And then they, because then you've got to know them. They, they can say, they will come out with anything. You know, oh, my, for an example, family member's gone into hospital. And then you're like, okay, well, what are we going to have a chat about? Let's go and walk around the site. Um, I'll show you this other job. And, you know, we'll, we'll go and have a little chit-chat around the site. If anyone asks, I'll just show you another job to do. Uh, I have done this before uh, where I did walk someone across site. And I just had a bit of a heart to heart. And at the end of it, it's nice knowing from them that they can trust you with things. And obviously that's good for their mental health. Um, because it is quite surprising the 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 construction industry has the highest suicide in the UK for mm. mental health. Uh, I'm not saying it's work related, but these guys do work in the construction industry. So that was the main thing I did want to see brought into the industry was that. Okay. Um, yeah, no, and we've both been directly affected by this, haven't we, with the late passing of our former owner and employer that's correct yeah that's correct um so if i if i fill in the audience on this obviously the company uh was going through some financial issues which i've spoken about before previously and unbeknownst to myself and the other project managers and directors the company was actually going into liquidation and it was only once i was informed by our owner that we fully understood the extent of what was actually happening with the company um, because he had kept everything to himself emotionally and financially associated with the company. In the days that followed after that announcement, obviously his demeanour diminished and obviously being a multimillionaire, I never thought twice about his mental state i always yeah. thought okay he's got a few million in the bank he he's got a lovely home he can go to and his his career uh, is over for, for for him and he can go into a lovely retirement the rest of us have got to kind of look onwards and upwards that we're only at the beginning of our career um and it was only in the days that followed that we found out he passed away and i obviously in shock but the first thought that came to my head was why didn't I say anything to him yeah um I obviously saw how down he had been and I never really spoke to him to say how are you yeah um which is something I regret but I think you should don't regret it just learn by it that's what I tell people don't don't regret in life because you start regretting one thing, you you next thing you know, you're regretting a hundred decisions in your life. Live, just yeah. le- learn from it. And now the thing is, how you've said that, 
is now when you see someone who you think is going through something, you will stop and you will say to them, are you okay? Mm. You know? So yeah. yeah, don't, don't, don't regret it, mate. Just, just, you have to, you have to take, it's one thing we all did. Cause this guy was absolutely lovely, you know, obviously because of his wealth, he traveled a lot. So mm. I was just thinking, I would stump him on my honeymoon. I thought, you know, he came straight up to me and goes, Dave, so where, where are you going on your honeymoon? And I just thought to myself, yeah, he's never heard of this place. It's a small little island. Oh, in Antigua. Oh, lovely place, that. Yeah, we've been there a few times. <laughs> mm, yeah. So I used to actually ask him for advice where to go on holiday. Mm. Um, and he gave me advice to go to Cuba. And I went there, took my wife there for a 30th. Um, and it was great. Absolutely great. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't think there'd be a bad word said about him. Um, he obviously supported no. the company through thick and thin, and yeah. it, it was a it was a shame the way everything ended. Because I think Absolutely. really, even though everything's changed probably for all of us that were working there, we were I considered it a family. Yeah, absolutely. And even even with all the arguments like families do, we always still got around at Christmas. We all still had a laugh and a joke and. You know, I, there weren't there weren't very many bad times. Absolutely, but if you look back now on the guys who worked with, look because of the ALP, because of our, our reputation, look where these guys are now. For yourself, you're doing extremely well. A lot of people now are working on tier one companies, are electrical supervisors, AP roles. Um, other people are still on the tools because I absolutely love it. They just can't get away from it and that's all because of ALP this is because of the team we had because of everyone with the relationship they had you know there was a lot of respect and there was a lot of love at ALP you know we we showed that by we used to go out for breakfast every Friday it was like our own like it's like it was like religion that we had to do it it was one of those things and you know these guys I could pick up the phone you know if I, I've done it as well there was a few things I didn't know and I went, oh, this guy would know straight away. All right, Dave, what's, what's up? Oh, I've got an issue. Okay, send me a few photos, mate, and I'll give you a call straight back. And this is the this is the respect and love that was built over that company. Mm. You know, we still we still talk now. Everyone still talks now. We try we try our best to meet up for drinks, but obviously we can't at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're all locked away. So after I've after we've uh, poured our hearts out, I've got one final question. Yep, go for it. What's your favourite movie? Right, I had to really think about this because I I love a lot of films, as you know. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a stab, and I bet it's a Marvel. You, you, film. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, but really? you will get it. No, but you will get it. It's gonna be Dark Knight or something, isn't it? It is gonna be the Dark Knight. <laughs> it is. It's the first film that popped into my head. Yeah. When I thought about it. Yeah, it is the Dark Knight. It is my. F- I've watched the film probably about thirty times. Tell tell me why. See, the dark. What I really enjoyed about the Dark Knight is that you are taking a comic, you are taking a superhero, and you are taking a villain, and you're trying. What Christopher Nolan done is he brought them into our reality. So nothing was too far fetched. Everything that was in the films you can do you had the technology to do today basically so you know the batman bill for example was just a tank on wheels they probably the u.s government probably got one of these (laughs) in design anyway so and obviously christian bell hands down for me is the best batman okay that would upset a few people i know but he pulled the character off very, very well. His fighting technique in it was very, was very good. Um, did he do was, his own stunt then, did he? Yeah, he'd done his own stunt. So, well, that's more Batman Begins, that one. But yeah, he did do his own stunts. So in Batman Begins, when he's actually up on the wooden logs training, he he's was doing actually rock, doing a Rocky. <laughs> he was actually doing that. And the things what people don't actually realise is that he lost 150 50 pounds for the machinist so he was basically anorexic ribs showing everything then he went straight away after that film and put 120 pounds of muscle on Mm. so christian bell hands down is one of the best actors we've got at the moment 
Heath Ledger's Joker is still the best Joker, in my opinion. Walking Phoenix did a wicked job, absolutely incredible job. Jack Nicholson done a great job on his uh, like a, a DC comic version of the Joker as a comic mm. book version. But Heath Ledger's Joker was just like what you would imagine him today. And the thing he had, what no one can beat, and this is because he's the best Joker, is the fear factor. So when you look at him, you, you're you're cacking it. You know you're messing with someone who is just going to end you and laugh about it. He just, there's a clip in the film what people don't actually know. So when he goes up to Crash's party to find Harvey Dent, he walks in and Michael Caine sees him for the first time. And if you see, if you watch it, you see Michael Caine's face, just, he's shocked. He's, he's froze in his feet because this was the first time he actually saw Heath Ledger in makeup. And I'm a massive, I'm a massive fan of this film. I actually own the film script used in that film, and it has been signed by everyone, including Heath Ledger. What is just so I've got a bit of film history, basically. That's and what's cool. actually a funny and a good fun fact is actually this is the fourth rated best film on the IMB on the IMDb data as well. I'm slightly regretting this question because you're going on more than you talked about the industry. <laughs> <laughs> you, you asked me why I like it. Yeah, I know. I don't. I don't get bored of it. It's a film that I can, I can keep putting on, and it's just you see his acting skills, just incredible. Yeah, incredible. And on that note, thank you very much for your time. No, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Really, really. Yeah, good. I'm sure we'll have to um, get you on again and tell some more stories. Absolutely, mate. I'd be more more than welcome to do that. Um, I could think of a different film for the next uh, podcast. I'm sure I could cheer you. I cheer I, you I don't, I don't need about. to hear about another Batman film. So. Oh, it won't be. It won't be. <laughs> so thank uh, you everyone for listening.